Welcome, welcome everybody. This is the second seminar of the cycle on peace and Christian democracy that give it us a forum of archives and research on Christian democracy launched this year. In the first seminar, we started with the Italian case, the, the case of the Italian Christian Democratic Party and the issue that we debated together with Professor De Giuseppe was uh, in a certain sense, politis the politicization of the peace issue through party and ide ideological approaches. Today, we have to face a second crucial topic for a better understanding of the dramatic situation that started in February 2023 with the Ukrainian-Russian war. Uh, we will examine today something not anymore related to Western Europe, as it was the case in our first seminar, but related to Central and Eastern Europe. And second, we will explore one of the more complex issues in the, whole, in the whole story of peace efforts, if I may say. Uh, if we look at the history of peace movements, uh, a consideration emerges, and the consideration is that since their birth, the request for peace and the problem to defend human rights two elements that we may imagine as totally parallel, well, they are not, historically speaking. Very often, they diverged. Think the American War of Secession, the Spanish Civil War, the Second World War, deliberation struggles in Africa, Asia, Latin American of the 1960s. The 1990s United Nations responsibility to protect. Well, all those events repeatedly seem to demonstrate that the priority of accords and mediations as well as the renounce to military instruments might deeply damage the cause of human rights. Hence, one of the problems that historically emerged in studying peace efforts, it's exactly thing, th this, that is what to put first, peace, human rights, what kind of combination? And this is what we will try to to, to debate together. I have to thank very much Professor Ladislav Kabada who accepted our invitation. Uh, in a certain sense, he's a friend of Kivitas since some, some, some time. He teaches at the Metropolitan University of Prague where he's vice rector for research, development and, and quality. He's also member of the executive committee of the European Consortium for Political Research and president of the Central European Political Science Association. Um, he is also editor in chief of the journal Politics to, in Central Europe. He has thought or has been visiting scholar in many universities outside the Czech Republic. Uh, he has published many books. I mention only some of them, uh, all related in some way to today's topic. The first in 2010, Intellectuals and Communist Idea, the, the search for a new way in Czech lands from 1890 to 1938. The second, Ethics in Foreign Policy, 
postmodern states as the entrepreneurs of Kantian ethics. Third, Czechoslovakia and the Czech Republic in world politics. Fourth, party systems in East Central Europe. This, this is already very much to be ready and eager to wait for Professor Kabada's speech. So the floor is to you. Thank you again very much. Thank you, Professor Mauro. Thanks uh, for this very kind presentation of my person. And thank you for the invitation to this very interesting event. I really like this format of, of, of small webinars where uh, the place is given to discussion. So I will try at the very beginning uh, to present some basic ideas, basic thoughts, basic, basic names. Uh, but uh, I'm really looking forward to the, the further debate and, and discussion uh, about the topics I'm going to present. I've, I've prepared a short PowerPoint presentation. Usually I, I, usually I use the terms short, it's, it's, it has 20 slides. Uh, so I, 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 uh, I will try uh, to uh, uh, share with you. Okay, now it has to work, I hope. Yes. Uh, I'll just... Okay, there are some... Give me one second. Yes, of uh, course. Okay, this has to be... Five. Okay, so let me start. Let me begin. Uh, I hope you can sh you can see uh, the screen now. Uh, so, yes. Yes. Uh, I am going to, sp to to talk today sp specifically about the nexus between the issue of peace and the issue of human rights. Uh, I selected selected uh, one uh, specific specific uh, workshop. Uh, organized on organized in 1983 but of course at the very beginning I will present some so I would say more general framework for the debate uh, so the title you can see is the peace and human rights the influence of Christian democratic thought in the indivisibility of peace thesis of charter 77 so uh, to give at the very beginning some uh, framework as already mentioned by Professor Moro, I'm going to talk about a selected case from East Central Europe. You know that I'm talking about the nations that were strongly influenced by the dramatic uh, development during the 20th century. Uh, should it be the period of interwar atomization uh, in this area and uh, later the totalitarian periods uh, that came from, with Nazi Germany and later with with Stalinist uh, Soviet Union. Uh, when talking specifically about Czechoslovakia, one has to stress that uh, Czechoslovakia was the, was the nation and the country that grew up since 1918 as one of really very secular uh, nations and very secular political regimes. Ne nevertheless, when we are talking about Christian democratic politics, uh, I have to stress that since the establishment of Czechoslovakia, we can observe within, within the Czechoslovak political and party system very visible and very stable pillar uh, promoting the Christian democratic approach and Christian democratic policy. And it was the Czechoslovak People's Party it established in 1919 with three uh, country branches so Bohemian, Moravian and Slovak and specifically in Slovakia. Uh, the Slovak People's Party in the interwar period played the role of pivotal, pivotal political party, uh, gaining uh, approximately 35% of votes and re really uh, leading, leading uh, the Slovak politics. As regards the uh, development of Czechoslovak People's Party, I have to stress that uh, during, the, during the war period, the party was prohibited and it survived in, in exile, specifically in London. And uh, as far as I'm talking about the Czech or Czechoslovak, uh, Czechoslovak experience and history, I also decided to present some names uh, 
just for those who might be more interested uh, in the issues I, I'm going to talk about, maybe to search also some, some more uh, uh, information about the selected names from the list. Uh, uh, I, I will present at the, at the beginning. So I have to stress that after 1945, uh, the Czechoslovak People's Party uh, split it internally into two two very visible very visible streams. One promoting the cooperation with the Communist Party, and the second one that uh, continued to develop the Christian democratic uh, uh, positions and the Christian democratic policies. Here you can see some names as Adolf Prochaska, Bogdan Kuduba. Maybe I should uh, stress specifically Pavel Tigrit, who after 1948 uh, left Czechoslovakia, lived in Paris in exile, and Tigrit established a very known, very known publishing house. Uh, and the uh, review uh, called Svědectví, uh, which uh, was uh, reflected as one of the of the pillars of Czechoslovak uh, exile uh, exile groups uh, with Christian democratic orientation. During the first decade after the communist gain of power in 1948, the Christian democratic politics and the Christian democratic opposition was completely destroyed in Czechoslovakia. Here I mentioned three important names, very interesting people, Ružina Vackova, Otomov, Josef Svěřina, all of them sentenced uh, in the political trials uh, between, for between 12 and 15 years of imprisonment. And only in 1960s we could uh, observe some revitalization of uh, Christian democratic uh, police, politics or Christian democratic groups within, within Czechoslovakia. Uh, on the other side, I have to stress that the Czechoslovak communist regime also inherited strongly into the efforts uh, related with the uh, churches, uh, not only the Catholic one, but of course uh, the Catholic uh, church in the first place. And what was very visible was this uh, attempt of the communist regime to establish the regime controlled uh, and pro-regime priest associations, such as Velehrad Committee, Catholic clergy peace movement, and Pazem in Terris. Uh, by the way, you can see that in two of three, three uh, titles or names of these pro-regime associations, the term peace is also, also used. And last but not least, I, I would like to stress that the Christian democratic uh, history, uh, oriented historians, Christian democratic reflection also from exile, and I quote here uh, Jaroslav Cuhra, one of very visible visible historians with Christian democratic background from my generation, he's, 20, he's 51, yet uh, labels these associations as corrupted and divided. So promoting and following uh, perfectly what the communist regime and the communist leaders leaders uh, promoted. So I will more, more or less uh, talk uh, about the exile, uh, exile groups uh, with Christian democratic uh, or orientation. Uh, indeed, uh, before this, I would like to stress the specific development in the second half of 1970s, which led also to the establishment of uh, Charter 77. Uh, I'm aware that regarding Charter 77, we do have uh, recently enough materials also in foreign languages. Should it be German, should it be English? Uh, indeed. For those who didn't have uh, opportunity to study such materials, I would like to stress that uh, after the occupation of Czechoslovakia in 1968, uh, we can observe, I would say, this uh, lost years between 69 and 70, 76, where we almost cannot uh, cannot observe the visible opposition, opposition development and opposition activities in, in Czechoslovakia. To, uh, talking specifically about the Christian democracy and Christian Christian uh, oriented uh, oriented uh, position groups, uh, we do have enough evidence to reflect that in Slovakia we can observe uh, in uh, in 1970s much much stronger resistance than in Czech lands. By the way, the the resistance that was that was. Uh, uh, embedded in so-called small communities uh, movement organized by by the uh, not not the I would say uh, uh, top uh, top uh, placed uh, Catholic clergy but 
mostly uh, by the so-called common common priest uh, that created the foundation for the underground church and this is also something that might maybe has to be stressed with one sentence that in Czechoslovakia and in several other other countries in, in the in the uh, Soviet bloc since 1960s we can observe this uh, creation of so-called so-called hidden church uh, so uh, the, the situation where the people who were who were uh, uh, perceived as laicist uh, were uh, in secret form adopted adopted as a part of the of the clergy and they uh, secretly secretly offered offered uh, their their service and their support for the for the for, for, for the Christian communities in our nations. Uh, in 1977, based on the Helsinki process, uh, the Charter 77 was established. Uh, it happened at the at, at the eve of the years 1976 and 77, and uh, it, it happened in the situation when the communist regime that declared the so-called normalization period expected that the opposition is completely suppressed or left Czechoslovakia to exile. And uh, the regime was really, uh, really surprised uh, uh, that uh, new opposition, uh, opposition uh, formation was established. Uh, talking about Charter 77, one has to stress that it was at the, uh, at the very beginning uh, created specifically by the by the persons and personalities who, more or less, uh, unequivocally belonged to the to the. Uh, 1968 liberalization period of the communist regime. Among them are many former communists and so on. And I have to stress that the first response of the official circles in the first place, the Cardinal Tomasek, was, was uh, rejecting the cooperation with the Charter 77, stressing this uh, specific role and the, the, the specific specific uh, participation of the of the communist communist. Uh, uh, or former communist communist actors. Nevertheless, uh, specifically from the grassroots level, from the from the from the bottom up level, uh, many visible and very important uh, representative of relatively small but uh, strong epistemic community community com com uh, comprised from Christian Christian democratic uh, politicians, thinkers, philosophers, uh, joined Charter seventy seven. Here in the alphabetic order, beginning with Milan Balaban and at the end with Josef Zvěřina, you can see some, uh, I would say, very important names. Uh, I would like to stress that uh, talking about these people, uh, talking about Václav Benda after no November 1989, he became the father ground of Christian Democratic Party and he, he, he became a mem member of the parliament in both chambers. Uh, talking about about uh, Ivan Medek, uh, Ivan Medek was the chairperson of uh, Václav Havel's president office. Uh, Rolf Kuchera, by the way, the uh, mentor of my dissertation, ground, uh, founded in 1984. Very important uh, review, Central Europe. Uh, Radim Palos, the first rector of the Charles University after the November Revolution. Jan Sokol, the dean at the Faculty of Humanities at the same university. By the way, Václav Mali, who serves as a bishop today uh, in Prague. Uh, last but not least, I would like to uh, mention the specific role of important uh, European philosopher Jan Patočka, a uh, very important phenomenologist with, with Christian democratic orientation, who strongly influenced uh, the Charter 77 initial declaration, who strongly uh, influenced the, I would say, Christ Christianly rooted uh, frame of uh, Charter 77 activities, and also very visible symbol. Uh, Jan Patočka died uh, uh, in 1977 after the after the very violent violent. Uh, uh, very violent uh, dispute with the, with the uh, Czechoslovak uh, secret police and became became the visible symbol and martyr uh, of the first phase of nine, uh, Charter 77 existence. 
Indeed, uh, as, as promised, I will talk specifically about the Czechoslovak Christian democracy in exile. Uh, I do have two uh, main reasons for this. Firstly, I have to stress that Charter 77 uh, didn't develop, uh, I would say, specific discourse on uh, peace movement uh, in the first three or four years in, uh, in 1980s. Uh, stressing that uh, it was not established as the as the movement or as the as the uh, community that will specifically focus on this topic. And secondly, uh, in exile we are able to find uh, I would say uh, I would say a flagship activity with Christian democratic uh, with Christian democratic background and also the flagship activity that focused uh, strongly on the topic uh, that presents the, uh, the main, main issue of my uh, today's lecture or presentation. And this is the issue of uh, peace, peace movement and the Christian democratic approach uh, uh, towards peace and, and the activities we can observe uh, in, in uh, West European uh, nations at the beginning of 19, 1980s. Here, uh, for those who are interested in history, for uh, by the way, for those who uh, would like to search in the archives, I would specifically uh, stress the existence of Opus Bonum uh, community. It was the, it was, or it is still the Laical Catholic Association. It was established in 1972 in Frankfurt, uh, uh, Main in Germany. And in 1979, it was remo removed to Munich. By the way, this was very symbolic because in Munich, uh, there was located also the Radio Free Europe where uh, several actors, I, would, I will talk about them today, also, also acted as a journalist uh, who uh, uh, broadcasted uh, to the to, 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 uh, communist and occupied Czechoslovakia. Uh, recently, after 1989, Opus Bonum was relocated to Prague. It is located in the Benedictine Arch Abbey of St. Adelbert and St. Margaret uh, in Prague, in the, in the Prague district, district Brzevnov. So for those who would like to uh, search for, for uh, sources uh, related with the, with, with the Czechoslovak Christian democratic exile and Christian democratic activities, uh, I recommend recommend to, to, to establish a contact with this Benedictine Archabbey and with Opus Bonum that, that is hosted uh, recently there. And I would like to stress some personalities again uh, related with Opus Bonum. By the way, Anastas Opasek after, Opasek after 1989, he was he was the leading person within the uh, above mentioned Benedictine Archabbey. Uh, Ivan Medek, I already spoke about uh, about him. Milan Schulz, who will be mentioned repeatedly uh, in my lecture, and last but not least, also already discussed Pavel Tigrit. After 1989, he returned to Czechoslovakia. He was a member of the government as a minister of culture, strongly uh, uh, promoting the Christian democratic values within the right right wing uh, government uh, in 19, uh, 1997 and 1990. Eight. Uh, and uh, coming to the topic, uh, I, I, I would like to stress that Opus Bonum was or has been since 1978 organizing the annual meetings, we call them so-called academic weeks, uh, firstly in Hünfeld by Fulda uh, uh, and later since 1978 in North Bavarian Franken. Uh, and uh, next to Christian democratic speakers, they uh, also usually uh, invited other ideological streams. So if you if if, if you go through the through the uh, documents uh, that reflect these meetings, uh, we do have several editions of such of these meetings. We can also observe uh, the mutual exchange of opinions, uh, the discussion. Uh, the arguments uh, that, that were given at one side by Christian democratic uh, members of Czechoslovak leaders uh, exile and on the other side by the other, uh, should it be post-communist, should it be, uh, by the way, environmental or liberal environmental uh, groups and so on. And uh, I will focus today on the Franken Symposium organized uh, at the end of November 1983. 
uh, with the title Peace, Peace Movements and Christian Democratic Ethics, or Christian Ethics. Uh, uh, the editor of the book was already mentioned, Milan Schulz. He prepared the edition that includes not only all the contributions, but also the discussions, which uh, in many ways are uh, even more interesting. Uh, I was not able to find the book uh, in other language than in Czech, so I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not aware uh, if uh, it would be useful for you, but I saw the list of, of, of participants and I saw some names that seemed to me maybe Croat, uh, and I would say that uh, several colleagues that, that uh, might participate on this on this webinar uh, might be interested at least in some in some parts. Uh, firstly, the book is available online, so you can see not only the bi bibliographical uh, in, uh, information, uh, but also also the web, web page. And uh, I already already downloaded the book as an ebook. So uh, for those who are interested, at the end of my presentation, I will again present also my email address. Uh, if do not hesitate to write to me, I, I will send you the book, the complete book, uh, be, if you are interested in this book. And uh, uh, sorry, I, there is some mistake. Uh, it's another presentation now. So sorry, I will skip and I will I will jump to uh, other pre other presentation, uh, which I I have sent to me via email. So I will find it. Please give me one minute. This is the problem with too many, too many uh, PowerPoint presentations. It has to be this one. Okay. So this is the correct presentation now. Okay, so I will continue, uh, and uh, I will present. Uh, I would say several uh, several presentation and the main ideas presented during this during oh. during this meeting. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we, we saw okay. this. Yes, we we, we okay. can see it. Yes. Okay. Perfectly. So I will begin with the with the with the uh, theologist Peter Kolaj, uh, who presented the paper that focused uh, focused on uh, I would say more theological and philosophical background. Uh, he was talking about about the situation of non-war uh, life uh, during during the detente period in the nineteen eighties. And he was stressing, uh, stressing the very, very, uh, I would say, nodal uh, issue uh, reflecting the Christian democratic debate. So the preference of imperfect peace before the real war. Uh, and the endeavor that after the, uh, also the endeavor after the true peace uh, that is growing uh, at both sides of our Iron Curtain he was stressing uh, the very, very important, important issue, namely that uh, it has to be the peace. He used this very symbolic terms uh, of bridge, bridge architects, and not the peace of wall architects. And later, he was discussing uh, discussing the issues that, that are related with the sort of just war, so the Bellum Justum. Uh, Using the quotation specifically from Augustinus Aurelius, uh, the the the, the Dei, uh, uh, book, uh, and uh, he specifically stressed something that uh, will, will be will be also present in in other speeches and other presentation, and this is the this is the new form of of, of war. Uh, that came with the modernity, so uh, the, the war that is uh, extremely destructive, the war that is that is really uh, challenge, challenging the existence of of, of humanity uh, in in this world. So uh, he was stressing that the modern war is not able usually 
to follow this this uh, this reflection of just war as a revenge for the violation of law and he was also presenting uh, the pope john the 23rd encyclic pacem interis uh, stressing stressing the issue that the peace has to be rooted in the balance of power and uh, the situation uh, of uh, imperfect peace or non-war situation has to be replaced by mutual trust that has to build, be, be built up continually with the discussion with the with the with the uh, i would say promoting of 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 trust and by, by the way something that really came uh, after after gorbachev came into the crowd after power specifically collage was talking about the situation of east germany i'm talking about czechoslovakia position, but Kolaj was stressing that the German Democratic Republic is the only nation in the Soviet bloc where we can observe the real independent peace movement that grew up from the from the civic initiative. By the way, he was stressing stressing uh, uh, the position of two very visible East German uh, associations. At, the, at one side, the German Democratic Republic Luther's Church and also the Evangelic Synod. And both of them, both of them, uh, criticizing the militarization of uh, East German society, and specifically requesting the service without weapons uh, that should should be available for those who reject to to uh, serve in the East German East German military. He was also talking about uh, West German and United States bishop conferences. By the way, uh, specifically, he was uh, presenting the term just defense that was in both uh, documents presented by the bishop conferences uh, preferred before the term just war. And he continued uh, with the this discussion about the letter of U.S. bishops, uh, which, which was uh, published uh, in, in mid-May mid 1983, uh, where uh, the, the United States bishops differentiated between the conventional and nuclear war. Uh, indeed, he was stressing that not only nuclear weapons uh, might, uh, should, should be reflected as something, something unacceptable. He was stressing the uh, matter of fact that also the conventional uh, weapons might be used for annihilation of whole cities and extensive territory, territories, including their inhabitants. He was uh, promoting the idea that the first use uh, idea must be completely rejected. And uh, by the way, some uh, at, at the end, two, two quotations that to me are very, uh, very closely related with the position of Charter 77 as a whole. Uh, firstly, I quote, the nonviolent resistance is not the path set to weak or cowardly. And the second quotation, good intentions are not enough to justify immoral methods. So I would say it's it's very, very, very uh, visible uh, Christian democratic position searching for uh, discussion, searching for, uh, I would say, uh, reject a rejection of uh any type of uh military uh militarism uh, any type of uh strengthening strengthening the uh conflict between between uh, the blocks and uh promoting promoting uh the brotherhood idea uh, that uh, has to overcome the iron curtain uh, more critical was Wilhelm Hale, uh, another speaker. Uh, I use this quotation, Pacifism or Realism, which was the title of his paper. And uh, he specifically focuses on this uh, uh, constructed reality of binary opposition. Uh, at one side, there should, be, there should be the people that uh, promote war. And on the other side, uh, there should be the people that promote peace and uh, the third way does not uh, exist or there, there is no place for this third way. He used the term tertium non datur. Uh, and he also used this term so-called peace movement. Uh, 
which means that he was uh, rather critical regarding the West, uh, West uh, European, specifically German, by the way, uh, peace movement. Uh, and uh, he completely rejected, uh, rejected the idea that th these peace movement uh, actors promote or present themselves as the only legitimated alternative uh, uh, who monopolize the right to talk for the peace, so-called peace side. Uh, he was also stressing, uh, stressing the, the necessity to reflect, uh, to reflect the nature of Soviet Union, to reflect the Soviet legacy, uh, and to set, settle the term a peace policy uh, into the broader context of Soviet history, Soviet camp history, and also into the into the context of uh, Soviet uh, Soviet real goals. So. Uh, the peace, po peace policy for him is not only the tool, but uh, he stresses that the eschatology uh, and, the, and, the, and the situation of quasi-religious nature of Soviet, Soviet ideology stays unchanged, uh, and that the main goal is still to overrule the world. Uh, he mentions that for, for the USSR, the detente is above all the new form of class struggle, and uh, I like this sentence at the end. The Soviets do not intend to lead the global world, but to size control over, over the world. Uh, and uh, for him, the peace movements, uh, specifically the German peace movement, uh, might be reflected also as a tool uh, that has to isolate the Western Europe from the United States and vice versa, and he reflects it as a, as a, as a primary primary uh, Soviet goal. Uh, so he stresses that for him, the Western peace movement wants to forget about everything uh, that what we know about the Soviet policies. Uh, by the way, he was uh, questioning also the uh, assumed financial support uh, from the Soviet bloc for the Western peace movement or some of these Western peace movements. Uh, and he stresses that uh, the idea that the Western Europe has to unilaterally demilitarize, as promoted, for example, by the German Green Party for the first time in the in the in the Bundestag at that time, uh, would mean the capitula capitulation under the under the motto "better than better red than that." And he asks this, uh, I would say, very sensitive question: if the West European pacifist would also accept the motto "better Nazi." than that. So equalizing the Soviet totalitarian or post-totalitarian regime with the Nazi Germany regime. Uh, so he, he is using the term Pax Sovietica. By the way, this term was repeated in almost all, all the uh, partial or individual presentation at the, at the, at the workshop. Uh, so Pax, Pax Sovietica for him is the situation without war, but not uh, with the freedom. So he is talking about maybe protectorate, maybe gulag, but definitely the peace of servitude. And uh, he also asks uh, this question that, that is very, I would say, common for exile. So uh, what the average Western pacifists know really about the nature of communism and about, about, about how communist, communist ideology and communist regime really, really works. Last but not least, he stresses something that uh, was very visible, and it was, it, it was anti-Americanism uh, of some or several West, Western peace movement. Uh, in the similar manner, also Petra Rakushanova was talking. By the way, Petra Rakushanova is uh, still active journalist. Uh, she used she used this term: "Ceasefire is not a peace." So he was talk, he was talking. Uh, or she was talking about 40 years of peace uh, that are illusion. Here the quotation, the, the ceasefire between the West and East is redeemed by millions of victims in so-called local wars and the brutally enforced cemetery motionlessness in the Eastern Europe. So she stresses uh, specifically that peace is the term that might, uh, might work in very different or might be placed in very different collocation, very different uh, syn syntax, in very different uh, semantics. And uh, she stresses that for the people, 
peace does not present only the ceasefire, but above all the respect to their dignity. I mean, this is very typical for Charter 77, stressing this dignity uh, issue. And uh, he, she is stressing that uh, for her, Soviet Union is the blackmailer that dictates the rules. Uh, and the Western is uh, it, the West is losing in her position the act, proactive or active role. It only in only reacts, uh, and she is the first of the speakers that stresses uh, the issue of in, uh, peace and human rights nexus with this notion on indivisible form, uh, uh, which uh, which collocates peace or uh, interconnects peace and human rights issue. Uh, Jaroslav Langer, philosopher, uh, very interesting paper. Uh, for those who are able to, 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 to read Czech, I would say this is the real the, the platonic oifalos of the meeting. So the, I was a per perfectly argumented presentation. Uh, he uh, firstly falsific falsificates the assumption that the demilitarization as one of the tools promoted by some Western peace movements really produces peace. Uh, in his opinion, it is a mistaken assumption. Uh, he stresses that uh, peace itself uh, or, or the peace that would be produced by this demilitarization uh, would be the situation without war. Uh, that is nothing more than the period of break between the wars. So I would say he uh, promotes the something we, we can call Kantian, Kantian position. So he what he is thinking about how to uh, change the situation towards the future eternal peace in the Kantian in the Kantian manner. And uh, in that way, he stresses that any real and lasting step towards the militarization has to grow up from the turns towards political peace. So he's stressing that it is not about demilitarization only, but specifically about the open talks uh, between and among the politicians from both sides of the Iron Curtain. And uh, he also stresses again that the peace is the situation of securing the human rights. And uh, for me, it is one of the very, very visible, very visible, uh, uh, speakers who uh, promote something that we know from 1990s as the so-called humanitarian interventionism. So I quote, applied on the human rights issue, the principle of non-interference adopted by the United Nations present, presents the global crime against the humanity. Uh, it's very, I would say, very hard, uh, hard, hard uh, declaration stressing that the uh, Global affairs uh, should follow follow the issue uh, should should follow the basic idea that every human being in this world has to be has to be protected uh, uh, has has to has to uh, positively positively uh, use the freedom from war freedom from fear uh, and has to be and its uh, human rights has to be secured. So he, he rejects this, uh, I would say, I, uh, idea of Brezhnev doctrine of limited sovereignty of uh, of uh, nations uh, living under the under the Soviet so, Soviet umbrella. Uh, specifically, I would like to speak about Charter Seventy Seven. I gave the, ta the the name of this of this. I would say. Uh, flagship uh, civic activity against the communist regime into the title of my presentation. So, and Willem Brechan, the historian, by the way, is still active, being 90 now, uh, who lived in the Bavarian exile uh, and who uh, prepared a lot, several editions of, of uh, exile documents uh, reflecting the Czechoslovak anti-communist movements and anti-communist uh, political actors. Prechan was discussing the Charter 77 and its position regarding the regarding the peace uh, and peace movements. Uh, at the very beginning, I already already mentioned that he stresses that Charter 77 was not established as the primary peace movement. 
Uh, it grew up from, from Helsinki process and uh, the related international documents I quote against wars, violence and social and spiritual oppression. Uh, nevertheless, he stresses that in the period 1980 to 1983, we can find several documents of Charter 77 that reflect the issue of peace and peace movements and that uh, somehow built up uh, the general position of Charter regarding these these uh, issues. And uh, again, uh, what, what is uh, very visible is this focus on nexus. So uh, peace and human rights present the nexus that uh, they, they cannot be uh, divided and they, they can be discussed separately. I quote, the right for life and freedom from fear, from war belongs to the codex of basic human rights. Uh, uh, and uh, here it is stressed that the Charter 77 uh, promotes peace. It reflects peace as a very important uh, cardinal topic, but it doesn't give any precedence to the right for life before other rights and freedoms. So in, in Charter's perspective, I quote, there exist the values for which the life might be sacrificed. So this is the concept of just just war in more 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 or less, uh, and what Charter seventy seven promotes is not only peace, but the peace with something that we might call predicates, so the humanly dignified peace life. Uh, Charter seventy seven stresses that the right for life must not be understood as the right for whichever life, but I quote the life where the basic values of humanly dignified existence are respected. Uh, so Charter 77 rejects any peace that would be, I quote, the peace of concentration camps. Uh, and specifically, it is stressed the experience of Czech, the historical experience of Czechos uh, Czechoslovakia, but also Europe uh, from 1930s, uh, I quote, uh, Czechoslovakia catastrophically suffered the effort for peace for any prices. So this is the criticism of uh, what we know as appeasement policy uh, promoted specifically by the French and British governments uh, in the second half of 1930s. So uh, Edouard de la Guerre in, in, in France as a prime minister and, and Neville Chamberlain in the United Kingdom as a, as a prime minister. Uh, and the Charter 77 stresses that we know that the world peace is by far not unambiguous. Uh, so the main thesis uh, that uh, goes as a red line through the different materials of uh, Charter 77, mostly these materials were uh, prepared by one of three speakers. Uh, the Charter 77 was uh, represented by three speakers that changed uh, every, every year. Uh, by the way, three speakers because quite often one or even two speakers were imprisoned uh, so to, from, uh, to ensure the continuity of work within the Charter, and that the main thesis is the indivisibility of peace. So it asked, I quote, inseparability of the effort for peace from the effort for respect toward, or towards human rights. Uh, so uh, Charter 77 uh, was stressing uh, the matter of fact that the peace has to be reflected also as a protection before th uh, the internal despotism. So it is not, all, uh, not only the discussion about the peace among the nations uh, or states, but also the discussion or the, 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 the focus on how to put an end to violence and injustice inside of states. Uh, so the role of any peacemaker has to be to ensure the respect to human and citizen rights in every single country, it has the human freedom and dignity regarding the conviction, faith, assembly, speech, etc. By the way, if I jump seven years uh, forward, in May 1990, exactly these, uh, these uh, words and sentences will be used by Václav Havel, the newly elected democratic president of uh, newly democratic Czechoslovakia in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council, Council of Europe and the human rights protection and human rights based uh, foreign policy became one of the 
I would say, I would say role models that you uh, within the Czechoslovak and later Czech foreign policy. So the Charter 77 and also the Christian democratic thinkers within the Charter 77 or in the Czechoslovak exile stress the mutual nexus between the external and internal peace and the individuality of uh, external and internal sovereignty that is related with this, uh, with this peace situation. Uh, as they stress, the peace is impossible without freedom. I quote, any attempt to save peace at the expense of freedom will after all not save neither peace nor freedom. So I would say this is the this is something that uh, that is a legacy and this uh, I would say lessons learned from appeasement period in 1930s. Last but not least, I quote, it is difficult to believe in frankness of peace effort in the reality where the people asking respect for human rights are persecuted. So uh, chapter 77 stresses it is very difficult to accept uh, that uh, at one side the regimes such as Czechoslovak, East German or Polish are promoting peace and positively present uh, the Western peace movement and on the other side those who uh, promote human rights or even those who promote peace. So for example Czechoslovak dissidents who at that the small uh, size demonstration promote the demilitarization of Czechoslovakia are usually persecuted, imprisoned, imprisoned, and uh, uh, excluded from the from the uh, public life. Coming to the end, uh, the first issue I would like to stress that what we see in the Charter seventy seven and also the Christian democratically rooted pillar within the Charter 77 position uh, towards the peace issue and the peace movements is the global mission. So repeatedly we can observe this uh, uh, focus on all human beings. It's not about blocks. It, it is not about the West and East, but it's about every single person in this world, which is in my, in my deepest, deep, deep, deep belief, the very, very, very uh, crucial Christian democratic position. Uh, it's a global mission. So we should think about the global peace. We should reflect not, by the way, not only the military, uh, military dangers, but also the uh, new challenges uh, for the for the human dignity, for the development uh, uh, in all regions of this world. So even in the in the documents uh, analyzed in, since the period 1980 to 93, we can observe find the ecological frame. We can find the no, notion on growing social unevenness between the global north and south. By the way, these terms are used in this in these documents. And last but not least, uh, I would like to stress this very, I would say, very deep, very uh, em clearly embedded meta narrative. A very philosophical meta narrative of postmodern identity crisis. So uh, we are living in the period uh, of the crisis of the world, which is the crisis of powerful growing from the general crisis of human responsibility. So the focus on this uh, human responsibilities, the responsibility of political elites who are not able, who are not, not able to overcome the sit situation of non-war. Uh, should be challenged by by this uh, by the by this I would say uh, new uh, political activism. Uh, by the way, searching for a new form of very traditional values, which more or less are uh, labeled as as the Jewish Christian tradition. Uh, we, we should we should follow. Uh, last but not least, uh, I would say this is this is something that is very 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 uh, crucial uh, when I'm talking about this focus on every human being in this world. I quote: "The biggest danger for the outbreak of war presents the disrespect towards the dignity and freedom of the of the others, uh, the treating the other not as the fellow man." So the call or 
of the commemoration that all people are brothers uh, and uh, that we should really respect every single person in this world in this in the same manner uh, which uh, which uh, grows really from from this very ethical uh, ethical background given by Papučka, given by Havel, given by uh, by uh, many other uh, Christian democratic uh, democratic uh, thinker within the Charter Charter seventy seven. To come to to the conclusion, uh, I had to stress at the end that uh, and it was clear uh, from my presentation that the Charter seventy seven was not and is not the purely Christian democratic act. Uh, so usually we are talking about three uh, visible pillars: the Christian democratic, by the way, very ecumenic in the Czech, in the in the Czechoslovak situation. Uh, then the uh, pillar of I would say intellectuals, uh, which usually might be labeled as liberal, uh, and then uh, the pillar of former communists. But these three pillars. Uh, more or less followed uh, the legacy or the heritage given by Papučka and the legacy with which really grew up from, from purely Christian democratic, Christian democratic orientation. So the principles that are implemented or very implemented by both the clergy and the laicist members within the Charter 77 and like-minded associations, uh, I would say present very important frame and values. Uh, and uh, generally, I would say at the end that the Western peace movements were mostly reflected through the very critical lenses. By the way, the pillar or the stream within the Charter 77, who was, I would say, more positive about the Western peace movement was the post-communist pillar. So the people like Zdeněk Klinář, for example, uh, or uh, talking about the Italian experience, Jiří Pelikan, the former, former director of the Czechoslovak, Czechoslovak TV, who after the uh, Soviet occupation of Czechos Czechoslovakia left, uh, left to Italy uh, and uh, lived in, 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 in the exile in Italy. So the uh, Christian democratic uh, and conservative uh, streams within the Charter 77 were much more critical uh, they usually, usually uh, stress that we should not think the recent situation at the beginning of 1980s without reflecting the long-term development of Soviet camp, Soviet uh, strategies, Soviet legacies. And they uh, rejected any attempt to exchange peace uh, for the freedom and for dignity, uh, repeatedly stressing the very negative experience of appeasement politics uh, promoted in the 1930s uh, regarding Czechoslovakia, uh, but also other nations in East Central Europe. So this would be uh, as a kickoff uh, presentation from my side. And I look forward to uh, all your questions, all your comments uh, and the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Kabbala for this fascinating, brilliant uh, contribution. Uh, all in the expectation have been met. We are at the core of one of the great problems facing every peace effort. And I think that this uh, Eastern European perspective point of view, if you want, is a great addition to the understanding and acknowledgement of the problems of war and peace. Uh, of course, in this Eastern perspective, according to me, there is a reaction, an obvious, a natural reaction to the peace rhetorics and propaganda coming from the Eastern Bloc, of course, but I think there is also a sharp distinction uh, from the uh, approach of the Western pacifist uh, movements. Uh, the point that impressed me most is that this perspective invites us to avoid a binary approach uh, to the issue 
to have a much more complex approach to the peace and war issue than the obvious, natural, traditional, binary one that is pacifism versus bellicism. This is not the case. Uh, reality probably is much more complicated and what we were listening today is a great contribution to this more mature and complex approach to the problem. Uh, I want to not to take away time, we have some minutes left to this seminar because this is this would be a seminar. This is an, an opportunity to exchange views and debate uh, topics. So uh, now I would leave the floor to the audience and ask them if there is if there are comments, questions, observations to be addressed to Professor Cabada. I don't know if you are so able, so capable to raise hands and bring note for the question. Okay, maybe maybe in the meanwhile, maybe some, yes, some, yes. Somebody, somebody writes uh, into the chat the question or comment. Uh, just one issue. I, I didn't have enough time, so it it it, it was it, it was uh, I, I excluded the, the, the all the attempts to uh, to compare the situation from 1980s with the recent situation. You, Professor Moore, mentioned at the very beginning uh, uh, the issue of Ukraine, of course, which yes, is of course. a challenging topic. And living in East Central Europe, one has one has to think also about the legacies and, and about about, uh, I would say, uh, repeated history. Uh, so I would say what was very important uh, if, if when I go through the docu documents and uh, materials, I, 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 was, I went also through the book of Václav Havel's speeches from 70s and 80s called For the Human Identity. And there was a, I, I would say, basic idea uh, We, we, sh we should prevent any attempt to exchange our individual partial freedom, uh, well-being for, for, for the others who will suffer from such decision. And this is something that seems to me very similar to the situation we face today. Uh, I follow, follow the discussions, uh, the different national discussions, of course, the Polish, read in Pol the Polish newspapers, uh, by the way, the Hungarian, very very interesting in many ways, but also in some Western nations. I spoke last last week with my colleague from Portugal, and the, the, the general position in Portugal: it's not our business; it's too far for us. Uh, so, it, it, uh, when we are talking about, I would say, some shared shared values, when we are talking about some European European heritage and so on. Uh, I would say that, that the Ukrainian Ukrainian uh, suffering nowadays presents another another piece uh, and, and another another impulse for this debate about uh, indivisibility of of uh, I would say general values uh, which should be promoted worldwide and which should be definitely definitely uh, prioritized before before the others. Uh, last sentence. Uh, I have spoken about Czechoslovak foreign policy uh, and Czech foreign policy. The human rights issue uh, in the binary opposition with the economic diplomacy uh, and how to how to find some, I would say, equilibrium balance uh, between these general values at one side and this what might be called the economic or homo economicus interest. I would say this this is something that is visible in all societies in Europe recently. Uh, when we look into the public opinion surveys, when we look into the political debates, uh, at one side we have to we have to support them, and on the on the other side is it's not our business. Uh, and why why should we matter for that? 
so I would say this this is also I, I would say the reason why it is worth to read this document, why it is really yes. worth to, to repeat something that was said uh, 40 years ago, but still has, I would say, very, I would say, uh, universal, universal message for us. Well, thank you very much. This is very interesting. It is exactly the approach we had. It is, of course, we are not debating the Ukrainian-Russian case. Uh, it's not our intention, but we would like to come back to reflect to the heritage, to the heritage uh, the, the, that Christian democratic thinking has left in decades of reflections and contribution to try to see if there is something in it that may help us to understand in a better way today's situation. This is exactly what you were talking to us in this very interesting way. So uh, I don't know if there is some intention to make an intervention. I make an appeal to the audience. Seems not. <laughs> Probably this means that everybody was totally convinced by the analysis you made. Uh, what I know, I have a question, a curiosity to this. What I know about the relation between Charter 77 and Western peace movements uh, is that at the beginning, there was a sort of un understanding uh, why you put peace as a priority, unique priority. Our problem is not peace as a priority. Our problem is human, our human rights. Uh, but if I remember correctly, in a second phase, these difficulties were overcome. There was even, if I remember correctly, an international meeting of the European uh, nuclear uh, campaign in Czechoslovakia. Yes, I would. I would like to know something more. If you, if you, if you have something to to tell about this. Yeah. Uh, first, firstly, uh, this misunderstanding. I would say it's also visible when when you go through the documents. Uh, uh, the Western peace movement was uh, specifically by the Opus Bonum, as the Christian Democratic uh, Community, uh, mm -hmm. more or less equalized with the German Green Party. And the German Green Party was really very radical at that time. Yes. Uh, they were really yes. phobies. Total uh, demilitarization. And they came with the, with the it was also the slogan, uh, better, better red, uh, red than dead. And the second slogan was to, to abandon NATO. So the West Germany has to leave NATO. Exactly. I would, I, I would say this was, this was the, uh, I would say, point, point of no return for the discussion. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, this, this is the issue was stressed by Václav Bělohradský, the Czech Italian philosopher. And uh, but I would say that uh, with with the with the with, with, with the uh, I would say new generation of green politicians uh, and also with with I would say real behavior of German German social democrats uh, which were also perceived as I would say prone towards demilitarization uh, there were built up new bridges between, between uh, or among these, these different different positions. As regards, as regards the, the event you mentioned, yes, it was organized in Prague in 1983. Uh, at one side, it was it was positively reflected that the people could meet and discuss the issue. Uh, on the other side, spe specifically Havel Havel was writing then a letter 
letter to the to the to the part, uh, partners from this from this Franken meeting, and Havel was stressing it that it is it is really shameful that several members of the Charter 77 was imprisoned uh, during this event. Uh, because they were trying to, 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 to come and talk about peace and it was forbidden to them. Uh, so I would say also yes. within, within Charter 77, we can, we can observe this, I would say, strengthening of fundamental positions of small, small, small part. By the way, paradoxically, exactly the people that would be uh, more or less uh, related with the Charter uh, Christian democratic position. Uh, so I mentioned Václav Benda. He became one of the most important promoters of uh, Augusto Pinochet, for example. Uh, and he even invited him to Czechoslovakia at the very beginning of 1990s as the most important fighter against communism. So I would say it sharpened the position of, of I would say, fundamentalists. I see. I see. Very, very interesting. I see a raised hand, Professor Giovanni Mario Sheshi. The floor is for him. Professors, Cheshi. We cannot see you or hear you. Perhaps there is some technical problem. Yes, yes. He wrote me that he has a he has a problem with um, his PC, okay. his personal computer. Okay. Okay. So, sorry. Just a moment. <laughs> just a moment. We may we may wait just yeah. a moment, of course. Nothing. Maybe it would be possible to write the question to the yes. chat. That would work as well. He is trying to solve the problem. Uh, I wrote him to, 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 to write in chat. No, it's not possible. <laughs> I'm sorry. He has a problem also for chatting. Uh -huh. Okay, maybe he's trying to, to, to close the connection and then uh, start game. So please, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, so, so it is not possible. Okay. Okay, if there are no other interventions, it seems not. I'm sorry for Professor Cheshi, but I don't know what kind of technical problems he had. Uh, we thank Professor Cabada again for his contribution today. So interesting, so exciting, so uh, thought provoking. Uh, and I simply remember to you that we will have a third uh, meeting of the cycle on June the 26th. This will be devoted to a third crucial aspect, the relation between peace and security with a focus on the German Christian democratic case. So thank you, everybody. We. I hope we will meet again. Thank you again. Thank you, Professor Cabada. Thank you again for the invitation and have a nice day.